are here to interview Professor Sonia Snaken of the Freie Universität Brussels. And it is a pleasure um, to interview you, Sonia. Thank, Thank you, you for Elena. coming. <laughs> um, well, this is the oral history of European criminology. So I think if everybody, if anybody ever listens to this interview, the first thing they would like to know is how did you come interested in the subject of criminology? Yeah, I have to go back a long way. <laughs> uh, when I started university, I was hesitating between sociology and law. Mm -hmm. um, because I was very much concerned about problems in society and social inequality and so I thought sociology will be better to understand all those social phenomena. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to go into politics and change the world, I thought maybe law is better than to change something, so mm -hmm. I chose law school. But then I found that law was not so much involved with changing the world. <laughs> um, but then in, in the third year of law school, uh, we had a course in criminal law and criminal procedure. And that professor took us to visit prisons and also a psychiatric institution for mentally ill offenders. And in Belgium, mentally ill offenders can be kept for an indeterminate period mm -hmm. in prison as long as they are not cured of their illness. Mm -hmm. But there was no treatment. So we visited a, an institution which had 800 patients, two part-time psychiatrists, and it was just dreadful. I mean, I thought we were back in the Middle Ages. Material circumstances were dreadful. There was no treatment. The psychiatrists were as depressed as their patients because they couldn't do anything. Um, so I thought, this is Belgium, 1975 it was. It's impossible. and Nobody seemed to care. In fact, you could not even visit that institution normally. It was only because our professor had a special contact with the director. Mm. <coughs> so I thought, we should do something about this kind of situation. And mm. those people themselves can't do it because no one would listen because they're mentally ill offenders. Yeah. Uh, but during that visit, I also remember because in, in, in criminal law, we learned that this was necessary because those people were dangerous and they were sick. So it, you know, they had to be kept out of society. Yeah. And then I saw a group of those mentally ill offenders, I think there were 15 of them, with one very young, very pretty nurse. And they seemed to adore her. So I said, okay. these are these very dangerous mentally ill offenders, and this young girl, she was my age, is all alone with them. So all these things that you learned in law seem so different in reality. Yeah. Uh, and then I had the chance that uh, the teaching assistant in that course of criminal law uh, was just finishing his PhD on prisoner's rights. So, um, okay. and he gave an optional course in the last year of the law degree, so I took his course. And so I became more and more involved in, in criminology. Um, but I was still hesitating then between human rights oh. and criminology. Um, but I wanted to do research in, in both, so I went to see the professor of human rights and I went to see the professor of criminology. And the one had no job for me, and the other one had. So, uh, <laughs> so I could have ended up in, in human rights okay. instead. But uh, that's also the reason why afterwards I tried to go back to human rights and combine my two passions in the end. Terminology and human rights, yeah. yeah. So I was imagining that from when you first began criminology in Brussels uh, to now, I mean, probably you were one of the very first beginners. Yes, at my university, in fact, I was the first full-time PhD student, uh, yeah, okay. because we had some doctoral dissertations before, but they would usually be practitioners who were working full-time outside uh -huh. of the university, but wanted to have a doctoral yeah. degree. Um, so my supervisor and myself were the two people of the criminology department mm -hmm. for many years, and uh, we were really fighting to develop it into a real department of criminology, and I think we very How many are you now in the department, for example? Uh, well, it varies between 40 and 60, depending okay, on the so number of research <laughs> projects that we manage. So from <laughs> 2 to 4 to 6, <laughs> yeah, I think. I think it's a success, yes. <laughs> it's a success story, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now we understand how you began a little bit. Um, I think you're really, uh, yes, famous, I would like to say. No, no, I think you're really very well known, always for your European approach. You know, I mean, not only for criminology and human rights, but if I, when I began studying, if I had to think in some European criminologist, I mean, it was, of course, Sonia Snakin, you know, I mean, it was like, you know, Sonia knows everything about Europe. You know, so I would like to know a little bit how you came to develop this very European approach. You know, yeah. I mean, some criminologists are 
British, some yeah, are yeah. Uh, Spanish, some are French, but you were European, I think. Yes, well, uh, coming from a law degree, um, it was very difficult to start with because I didn't have any methodological education in social yeah. science. So for many years, I tried to forget I was a lawyer or trained as a lawyer. I wanted to become a sociologist. So mm -hmm. I had to teach myself methods of criminological research. Yeah. And so for about 15 years, I was only involved in empirical research in Belgium trying to understand how courts function, how the public prosecutor yeah. decide about criminal offenses, uh, going into prison research. Um, and then I was, uh, because I still had this human rights interest, mm -hmm. uh, at one conference uh, in 1988, uh, I had just become a mother, <laughs> um, I went to a small working group uh, headed by Dirk von Zeil Smit and Frieda Dunkel. It was a very marginal little group of criminologists who were interested in, in dignity in prison and prisoners' rights. Yeah. Um, and because no one was interested anymore, that was a story of the 1970s, you know, yeah. with the big prison riots and prisoner yeah, movements. Sure. Um, and so then they decided that they would try to have every year a seminar where they would compare the situation of prisoners' rights and prison conditions in different countries, in Europe but also outside Europe. Yeah. So 1989 was the first uh, seminar organized by Friede. And we had Watt Morgan there and Dirk and I was there for Belgium. And then we had the first publication. And then when CPT visited Belgium in 1993, apparently they used my chapter mm -hmm. on Belgium to prepare their visit of the Belgian prison. So I was interviewed by CPT on their first day to give more follow-up information maybe on the situation. Mm -hmm. And after that, I was asked by CPT to become an expert. Yeah. So in fact, working on Belgium, but mm -hmm. in this comparative approach, yeah. Let me you. let me to becoming an expert for CPT, mm -hmm. and and I was an expert for CPT for almost fifteen years, mm -hmm. um, and then I also was uh, involved in the Council of Criminological Cooperation of the Council of Europe, yeah, um, and then into the Council for Penological Cooperation. Right. I think we should make a brief pause yeah. so that you explain <laughs> this yeah. rightly because it's not that well known for listeners. Yeah. You know, I mean, CPT I think is now well known, well yeah. established, yeah. but all the other. Um, institutions that you mentioned are not that you know well yeah. known. What is it they do? You know, so maybe you would like to expand yeah. a little bit. You were president of one of them, so yeah. I mean, yeah. I think <laughs> your knowledge will be well valued. Yeah. So I, I think to understand what Europe is trying to do, I mean, the Council of Europe is trying to do in, in prison matters, you have to look at three institutions. Mm -hmm. So you have European Court of Human Rights, mm -hmm. which is of course a judicial institution. You have the CPT, European Committee for the Prevention of Torture, who is doing the monitoring mm -hmm. of all kinds of institutes of deprivation and liberty and establishing standards um, to, to see how prevention of uh, ill treatment can be made more effective. And then you have the political uh, mm -hmm. part of the Council of Europe, which is a committee of ministers. So these yeah. are the ministers of foreign affairs of all the 47 countries. And they make standards that are seen as a consensus within the Council of Europe, uh, where the countries should strive for when they make new legislation, when they try to reform practice. Those should be the standards that they aim for. And uh, there is a committee for crime problems, yeah. which is in fact uh, the committee where the 47 countries are represented by civil servants, mostly people from the Ministry of Justice. And that committee of crime problems has an advisory working group who is working specifically on penological matters. Yeah. And that is known as the Penological Council, or Council. the Council for Penological Cooperation. So yeah. that's a, an advisory group where you have nine members coming from all regions of Europe, so we always try to have people from Scandinavia, the South, mm -hmm. Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe, Western Europe, because of course we have different traditions, we have different systems, yeah. Yeah. prison systems are very different, probation services, some of the Eastern European countries are just establishing them now, yeah. so that was something I really liked, F finding consensus yeah. uh, that is agreeable to all those different traditions and all those different situations. Um, so I started by being a, a member for five years, that was a period when European prison rules were drafted, yeah. uh, the rules on long-term prisoners, on parole, so 
because I had done a lot of research in Belgium on those issues with my PhDs uh, on long-term prisons, for example, with Hilde Tudex, on sentencing with Crystal Bays. So I had my experience from the Belgian part, I had my CPT experience in different yeah. regions of Europe because I had visited many Eastern European prisons with CPT. Uh, so that gave me some backbone to, to try to find a consensus because I knew the sensibilities in Eastern Europe and, and I had been to the Baltic states, I knew about the Soviet legacy of, of those systems. So yeah. it was really, I think, the mixture of everything that ha I had been doing that allowed me then to become president of the... and then I was re-elected, so I was president for, yeah. for six years until a member starts saying that this starts looking like the Soviet regime, so <laughs> we should have someone else now. <laughs> well, they sure lost it. <laughs> okay, um, no, just uh, I want to make another, but it's more an academic question, but maybe they will also like to hear what would be your evaluation of this European prison rules, of where those recommendations you make? I know it's easy to say, oh, they have no effect, yeah. but probably they do have some effect and you have some thoughts about it, you know? I yeah, mean? well, I, th I think both from um, cooperating in the drafting of, of the two major prison laws in Belgium mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and cooperating in, in the drafting of, of these standards with the Penological Council and helping to establish some of the standards for the CPT. I think the first victory that you find is that you find a consensus, yeah. that people are willing to draft this, yeah. because that is absolutely not evident, you know. And uh, we had a lot of discussions within the Penological Council because people were saying, well, we don't do it like that, you know, so yeah. why should we change it? So you have a whole exercise to start with, to trying to find this consensus. And then we had to defend it for the CDPC, for the Committee on Crime Problems. And there you have the civil servants who have their Minister of Justice behind them and say, well, you know, our public will not like this. And how far is this binding if, if we put something in, in those rules? Mm -hmm. um, and, and you could also see uh, when I, I became a president that the political pressure was increasing. And that was due to the fact that the European Court of Human Rights mm -hmm. was increasingly referring to those standards, both the CPT standards and the standards that were developed by mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. committee and were agreed to by the Committee on Crime Problems. So they wanted to have more control over what we were drafting. Yeah. Um, and especially on some topics, for example, I had to defend the recommendation on foreign national prisoners. Mm -hmm. And you could see that that was a very sensitive issue. Yeah. And some of the countries you would not expect, you know, the more liberal Western European countries, you know, known for their defense of human rights, were very restricted. And he said, you know, uh, within European Union, we have the framework decision, we are allowed to send those people back to, the, to their own country. Why do you want to deal with social reintegration of those people? Mm. We don't want to reintegrate those people, we want to expel them to their own country. Yeah. So some topics are much more sensitive than others, of course. If, if you deal with rights of victims, of course, you will have much easier solidarity than if mm. you're dealing with unpopular minorities like prisoners yeah. or... or especially in my consider at this time. So of course the, the political aspect is always there. So managing to get some of those standards through, I think for us was already a first victory because yeah. it meant you could find a consensus. But then you have the whole implementation, of course. Yeah. Uh, and that's where, again, I think you have to see what, what the European Court is doing, what CPT is doing, and what national organizations are doing, national NGOs, but also practitioners. Uh, we have also found during our CPT visits that sometimes the practitioners were very happy with a CPT visit because they, you know, this criticism you have, that's what we have been telling for years, but nobody wants to listen because it means they have to give more funding to prisons and they don't want to give funding to prisons. So having an official CPT report and having European prison rules as standards can help practitioners to have some reforms they want anyway. Uh, so yeah. maybe that's too rosy a picture, it's not always that easy, but it is certainly part of the picture that it's also helping uh, people in the countries who, who want to, to have oh. been more prison reform. Yeah, no, I don't think it's too rosy. I had a nice anecdote of when I was interviewing inside prisons and a prisoner came to me and he said, there's no justice in Spain, we can only expect something from Strasbourg. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, 
this prisoner knows more than the majority of criminology <laughs> students, right? So, right? so I, I think, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Are, it begins to be aware, an awareness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, would you say that all this second part of your life, this uh, European work with uh, a culmination or the, you know, the point of it was the book you wrote with Dirk, the European principles and prison law and policies? Yes. I mean, Absolutely, I think um, again this this ambivalence or, or the combination of being a scientific empirical researcher yeah. and being involved in these human rights standards for me was absolutely necessary because I found that, as I said, that the way I could uh, contribute to those standards was because I had this empirical research experience mm -hmm. and vice versa. Being involved in those standards made me look in a different way at my own empirical research. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because Dirk was one of the, the drafters of the European Prison Rules and, and also some of the other uh, recommendations. So we had been working together on those rules. We were working together, as I said, since 1989 in those yeah. small working uh, groups that we had on, on prisoners' rights. Um, so this combined uh, cooperation made us think, well, we should really put it into a book. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we wrote it in one year. Um, mm -hmm, yeah. Because it was based on, on so much of our work that we have been doing. And yeah. uh, of course, uh, it was really the aim to, to show the integration of scientific, social, empirical research in prisons yeah. and yeah. human rights standards and how the one should legitimize the yeah. other. Yeah. Uh, but then again, um, this is now 10 years ago, <laughs> uh, okay. things have changed. 10 uh, years is a scale reason. Yeah, <laughs> but things have changed and political yeah. pressure is certainly increasing and penal populism and political populism is, yeah. is increasing. Um, so we don't know what, what will happen, but I think uh, that integration of, of, of the scientific and, and, and the more yeah, humanitarian Human rights values, I think, is still important, and, and it had a lot of of good reactions, and yeah. uh, so we're quite proud of that book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so um, to the listener, she's too modest to say it, <laughs> but this book is known as the Bible of the European Court of Human Rights. So that's the book Sonia wrote with Durban Wilson. Okay, we covered second stage of your um, research life. Um, so what would you say now, you were speaking of the changes, political pressure, more conservative uh, times, so what are you doing right now? I mean, what is it that is concerning you right now? What is it that you're working? Where are your thoughts yeah. now, right now? Yeah, well, so on the one hand, uh, I continue uh, in, in the same area, but uh, in fact, going back to my more scholarly uh, part of uh, trying to assess now what all those human rights standards mean in reality mm -hmm. um, because there has been a lot of criticism that you know this is just soft law and it's just a rosy story of how prison should look like and mm -hmm. how probation mm -hmm. should look like but reality is it's much dire uh, so that's something that I'm, I'm trying to do now with colleagues so we're doing uh, different special issues. We had one last year in crime and social change on um, the effectiveness of, of CPT and other monitoring bodies mm -hmm. in their own country, in their own situation. Does it really improve the conditions for prisoners? And I think of course the the national researchers are best placed to do that. Um, yeah. But the problem is of course that very often you don't have a starting point, you don't have a benchmarking. And of course, CPT and European standards are not the only ones who are involved in, in reform. You also have NGOs uh, locally, you have practitioners, uh, you have political parties uh, who are involved in, in prison reform. So it's very difficult as a scientist again to say, well, this was the impact of those European yeah. standards because they're mixed in, in many other things. But yeah. that's the kind of exercise that, that we're trying to do. So we've now submitted something for the European Journal of Criminology. Uh, next year we will submit something also with Jonathan Simon. Uh, so outside of Europe as, as well, looking also to the United States, maybe Japan, uh, really international level of effectiveness of, of monitoring. Um, because I go back to my first concern, yeah. this was also meant to have impact for the prisoners who in many countries I have seen with CPT are really in terrible situations. Mm -hmm. And now the challenge when you do that um, is that you must remain legitimate towards society and society means the politicians, the practitioners, public opinion, um, 
victims um, because of course I have sometimes received almost you know hate phones by people saying yeah. why are you concerned with prisons dignity you should yeah. be concerned with victims dignity and unfortunately I could say well I am also concerned with victims dignity because I have also done research on victims yeah. and I have been the president of a reconciliation and mediation group in Brussels you know try to have a more restorative justice approach to situation and dignity of offenders and victims uh, but so keeping this legitimacy of this kind of yeah. topics is is becoming increasingly difficult I think and that's something that we have to be aware of because of course crime and punishment we try to offer also rational answers yeah. and a rational analyze, analyze but it's so emotional and yeah. understandably emotional I mean yeah. anyone who has been victim of crime or imagine that your child is victim of crime of course you're emotional so yeah. we have to deal with those emotions as well also in our research I think yeah, so that's something that I've been trying to do in lately looking to legitimacy of more moderate penal policies and how they can remain legitimate in the view of all those emotions and how as a politician but also as a scientist you should deal with those emotions and which emotions lead you where mm. because public opinion and, and public emotions are also very versatile uh, sometimes they're all, there's also an outrage because you read something about what happened in the prison um, when you look at the blogs of, of the newspapers mm. when it's mm. about prisons usually it's very negative you know, uh, you know these are criminals you should not be concerned about them but a few years ago um, there was a huge uh, prison staff strike in one of our prisons and uh, police took over and there was apparently a really racist uh, form of, of uh, treatment mm. Mm. and the uh, board of visitors uh, who is doing the surveillance of that prison made it public so it came into the media and then I looked at those blogs again and the tone was completely different because I said yeah I have also been treated by the police and I have also been treated disrespectfully by the police so people could recognize so yeah. suddenly it was not all those criminals it was yeah police is really we should do something about police conduct and about police violence and so making people or situations familiar or you could recognize what is happening yeah. I think is an important part of, of, of what we should do and <clears throat> I think that's also why it's important that at, at my university in our criminology department we have also been very much involved in, in practice and with practitioners and we try to give a lot of feedback of our research to practitioners and yeah. because we're mainly involved in qualitative field work we also need practitioners to allow us to do it so we have a quite yeah. intense cooperation with, with practitioners and I think that's also part of the legitimacy that you can have um, we have some <coughs> wonderful prison directors in Belgium with very innovative ideas and, and they also go into the media and you see that the public well they can't say a prison director is a lunatic scientist who doesn't know what's yeah. happening yeah. Those prison like that are talking about their daily experience um, so I think working together as a scientist with practitioners trying to influence policy makers and, and trying to inform public opinion I think is, is something yeah. that is something I, I want to, to continue yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I even see it with our students because uh, we have a penology course and then we explain all kinds of things and then we ask one of the prison directors for a talk and then we see if the prison director say something similar to what we have in it and say, oh, so it's right after all. <laughs> <You know? laughs> if a prison director agrees, then it must be true. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I was thinking, although I, I'm not sure what the experience in Belgium is, is it easy to make prison research in Belgium? I mean, to go inside prisons? How, how is that? In yes, compared to what we hear in other countries, it's still quite well, easy to have access. Um, maybe it's also due to the fact that uh, um, we have many prison directors who have a criminology degree yeah. and even during a certain period of time to become a prison director you had either to go through the internal ranks yeah. Yeah. or have a criminology degree. So the okay. criminology degree was the only degree which allowed you from the outside to become a prison director. Incredible. So we had a yeah. whole generation of prison <laughs> directors including the current and the former director yeah. general. <laughs> I mean, the current director general is a criminology student from our university. The former one was a criminology student from Ghent. So, even if they are in a different position, of course, they have different interests to defend normally. 
but we speak the same language yeah. and we have always been very critical about what is happening but they know that that's what criminologists do and because we try to do it I would say in a way respectfully you know we're mm -hmm. critical mm -hmm. but we try to understand why the situation is what it is you mm -hmm. know if, if you see how uh, we did research for example one of my PhD students on why people are ending in remand custody so often and then she was doing empirical research on a daily basis with the investigating judges and she could see that from the 24 hours that a judge normally has to decide maybe it was 15 minutes left to decide whether to release a person or to put him in remand custody 15 minutes and you don't have time to ask for uh, a report by the social workers you know, you know the public opinion is looking especially if it's a sexual offender so you understand that they don't dare to take the risk anymore in Belgium especially after the Dutroux case and all the terrible scandals that we had about that. Mm -hmm. So then you make a report about how to change that. How can you change the situation of that investigating judge so that they have more time to look for an alternative? Yeah. And you look at good practices saying, well, there it seemed to work a bit better. Why was that? Um, so in that sense, I think we try to have legitimacy also with the people we criticize because it's the yeah. situation very often that you criticize uh, yeah. and the situation in which you have to work. Yeah. That's very interesting also what you tell us about the influence of criminology background, you know, and education in people then occupying positions in the criminal yeah, justice system. Yeah. But that has changed now, we see that because uh, managerialism has taken over so much more, mm -hmm. of course, in, in all domains of society. Um, uh, it's no longer true that only a criminology degree can, mm. can uh, uh, lead you to uh, the function of, of prison director and especially they have been looking for managerial backgrounds okay. um, and that I think can be a good way because of course prisons have to be run also in an efficient mm. way mm. but prisons are very specific forms of, <laughs> of institutions yeah. and uh, I still think you really need penologists and criminologists to run sure. prisons uh, to mm. know that prisoners are also they have certain specific characteristics, you know, they, they come from specific backgrounds, they have specific, very often mentally ill problems, uh, social problems. Yeah. Uh, the group of uh, the prison staff also is sometimes uh, difficult mm -hmm. to manage uh, because they're also facing difficult situations in prison, so we have very strong prison staff unions mm -hmm. in Belgium, so... Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> it's, no, no. Uh, yeah. It's, it's a not complex easy. institution, no, yeah, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so we're um, beginning to face our end. I would like also to ask you, I mean, since what we said, that being um, a European criminologist, you were president of the ESC, you won the award of the ESC in 2015. So maybe a question would also be general, more transversal. I mean, what is the challenge for European criminology? How do you see European criminology? Have you? Yeah, well, of, I think of course it's it's a kind of personal point of view because I always try to have this combination of, of scientific research <coughs> and social impact and, and policy impact. Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, and, and what you read of course in, in all countries, uh, but not only in the, uh, the Anglo-Saxon countries where it used to be, but we heard yesterday also in the Scandinavian countries, which were always known for having moderate and, and more humanistic values in, in punishment, that there also penal populism is increasing and, and more largely, I would say, populist politics is increasing. So for me, I think the challenge is how criminology, European criminology, can remain legitimate as a source of information about Ooh. all those topics we're dealing with, about crime trends and, and causations of crime and what how to deal with crime and about punishment and, and what it means um, and I think that for me will be the big challenge uh, to, to keep that legitimacy uh, towards the media, towards public opinion and I think it's, it's also a challenge for universities because um, in many countries including my own uh, universities are now financed or not financed <laughs> uh, mm. on the basis of their excellent research and excellent research means only having international citations and publishing in international mm. Mm. reviews um, so we're forced to do that if our university has yeah. to stay alive but how do you combine that with keeping this social legitimacy because of course the public is not reading Punishment in Society, this wonderful journal we yeah. have. But, I mean, we have to do both. And 
I can see also f- from my younger colleagues that they say it's too much, we can't do it. You know, we also have a family, have a, a normal holiday, you know, not writing a book during your holiday as we did. <laughs> and well, I understand. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of pressure both from the university to have this excellence from society, what a criminology is doing, and a work life balance. You know, we still want to have a, a dignified life for ourselves. Yeah. Uh, so I really think the academic world should reconsider. Uh, and the politicians should reconsider if they want academics to be socially valuable. They must also agree that it's not on, you know, international publications that should mm-hmm. be taken into account, but also what you try to do for created your by special companies. I yeah. mean, <laughs> I mean not, not neutral precisely. Yeah. yeah. And maybe one thing I have tried to do also to to make it more clear is is for example comparing prisons with. Uh, other institutions with yeah. hospitals, because not many people know what a prison is, but many people have been in a hospital, and in a hospital you also feel very dependent, and you're also under the medical power. Mm. And the research that we were doing now, uh, even some of the patients, said, it's like a prison here, you know. If I, if I'm not on time for my lunch, I don't get my lunch anymore. What kind of institution is this? And then you get exactly the same reasoning by staff. You know, this is a big institution. If we don't have routine, this cannot function. So patients must listen to the rules. And if they're not on time for lunch, lunch is over. That's exactly what you hear in prison. Yeah. So I hope by giving that kind of comparison that people may start to understand a bit better what dependency means and, and how your dignity is affected if, if you're in such a dependency to it. Is it. Well, yeah, I don't like it either. So. Yeah, maybe that's a way. Oh, that's a very good to, point. To, You've always been interested with the parallelism between yeah. prisons and, and other mental institutions. Yeah. So I can understand yeah. Yeah, what you say. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do a last question that I hope will interest also uh, many of our uh, listeners, and that is, you know, when you, I think everybody that works in prison is always confronted by saying, it doesn't get better. I mean. <laughs> It's a prison. I mean, yesterday I heard you a sentence that I thought was wonderful. Prisons produce prisoners. Yeah. You know, I mean, and I think this, I still think this, you know, I mean, uh, people tell to me, but do you think, you know, if we reform, da, 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 and, you know, in the bottom line, I think, no, a prison is a prison, you know, it's a bad invention. It's a bad yeah. social invention. Yes. <laughs> we, we have to live with it. We can try to reform, but it's a bad social invention. I mean, I don't really think it, it is so good. <laughs> But I would like to listen a little bit to how you deal with this, right? I mean, trying to make better prisons, knowing there is no good prison, right? I mean, yes. how you deal with this always contradiction that comes yeah. with us when we work with prisons? Yeah, I think as long as prisons will exist, uh, that contradiction will remain. And I think what, what I have tried to do and what I also hear from prisoners is that prison, prisons differ. And some mm-hmm. prisons are, and I think of course the work that Alison Liebling has been doing uh, also shows yeah. us, some prisons are more survivable Bumble, yeah. for prisoners than others. And that has very much, is very much linked to how they feel respected and how they feel respected in their dignity as a human being. Um, and I think that's what I have been trying to do, knowing yeah. that of course the best thing would, would, would be to abolish them and to have something better, but we don't for the moment, not at least for all the prisoners. Very often, prison directors in my country would say, really dangerous prisoners, about 10% of my population. So that would mean that 90% of those prisoners should be somewhere else, or could be somewhere else. But they have been there before, or they have received a probation sentence before, and they were recidivating, so the end result is prison. Because that's the normal prison still, the, the normal sanction, I mean, especially if you're a recidivist. So I think what you can try to do is to make it more survivable to reduce the harm, because yeah. crime is doing harm to the victim, and crime is doing harm to society, to the trust in society, and punishment is doing harm back to the offender. So how, as criminologists, can we try to reduce harm? And that's, of course, also what Niels Christie was saying, you know, it's mainly about harm, you know, harm that you do to the victim and harm that we do to the offender. How can you expect a good result from both forms of harm? So, of course, we should react to the harm that the offender is doing to the victim, but we should try to do it with at least the least possible yeah. harm and the most care for the victim also because I think a lot of, of punitive feelings with victims is also because they don't feel respected because of yeah. the crime but also because of the reaction to their yeah. victimhood. I mean, 
you know, we had these dreadful uh, terrorist attacks in, in Brussels, uh, in the metro and at mm. the uh, mm. in, at Saventem Airport. Last year there was a, a man who lost his wife and he wrote a beautiful book and it's called The Jihad of Law uh, because he's from a Muslim background and he was on television saying nothing has happened for me and my kids during this year. So there's so much talk about oh we should do something about terrorism, yeah. we should do something about radicalization but he for a year was almost not helped and he has two small kids and his wife died in this terrorist attack. So I thought why don't we do something for them with the money instead of building all those prisons? We probably would need less prisons if we could do a more balanced approach to what offenders need and what victims need. Yeah. But I am and will remain probably an optimist. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I was actually, I wanted to finish my interview saying, how do you remain an optimist? I've always known you as an optimist, and I think that... <laughs> well, maybe because, um, yeah, I have also had some rewards. Uh, oh, in sure. prisons, I mean, I have been talking to prisoners uh, also during CPT visits who were so grateful that finally someone was listening to them. Yeah. And of course yeah. others were very you know, critical and say, oh, Strasbourg is just paperwork, it doesn't no. do anything for yeah. us. But others say, no, we're glad and at least someone is aware of us and is yeah. doing for us. And, and we appreciate that you're trying, yeah. even if, if, if you may fail and it may not always succeed, but at least we feel we're not completely yeah. forgotten. It's so touching, right, when they say, thank you, thank you yeah. for coming. Yeah. You know, yeah. Th they feel that somebody is thinking about them, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, so yeah. <laughs> thank you. So I think <laughs> that's important, not, yeah. not to go back to the situation where prisons were really the forgotten institutions, yeah. with all yeah. the danger that that entailed. Sure. And I have uh, wonderful colleagues and a whole new generation uh, in Europe and abroad who is uh, trying to do the same, so that gives me also some sure. hope that uh, when I retire next year, others will go on, including my own daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, as you see, it's fascinating. So we'll leave it here and leave it for an interview with her daughter in some following time, okay? Okay, I tell Thank her. Thank you so much, Sonia. <laughs> Thank you, Elena.